And next in the regional program, ladies and gentlemen, we present Bandwagon, produced by Harry S. Pepper and Gordon Kraft. <laughs> Gentlemen, here we are with another bandwagon. Arthur's here beside me, but as usual, he's going to be late. What for? Uh, well, we always start that way. Oh, yes, of course. Shall I go out again? Well, it might improve the show. Ah, uh, getting half nasty, eh? Who's getting half nasty? You are. Listen, I'm I not. Did, you I are. Did, uh, 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 big and stinker must agree like, like little birdies in a tree. <laughs> Pretty, isn't it? Yes, ever so. Now, talking about birds... I, I... Was, talking, I was talking to Norsia last uh, shut night. Shut up. I mean your pigeons, Basil oh. and Lucy. Now, there's a funny thing. I've brought them down into the studio tonight. Oh, by the way, I haven't seen any of your other pigeons lately. Right, they are, oh, uh, you mean Effie, Cyril, Claude and the rest of them? Yes, they were all flying about the flat until a week ago. What's happened to them? Well, uh, don't you remember last week we were running short of housekeeping money? Yes. And on, uh, we had chicken rissoles you had last Friday. Do you remember oh, those? Oh, big... Don't tell me they were made out of your other pigeons. Well, I didn't like to tell you, but they weren't. You see, I swapped the other pigeons with Sid Walker for some sparrows he'd run over with his barrow. Oh. <laughs> Say. So, actually, we had sparrow pie. Yes, that's what it was. Mm, I wish I'd known that. Why? Well, I don't like sparrow pie. What's more, I'm glad I don't like it, because if I did, I'd eat it, and I hate the beastly stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you doing with that gag? I'm supposed to be the comic. Well, I remembered it, didn't I? <laughs> Well, don't you crack any more funny gags, All right, see? and you promise not to either. And I get it. What, me? Yeah. Crack funny gags? Yeah. Huh, I never do. <laughs> it's just the personality. Uh, I see what you mean. <laughs> anyway, playmates, many of you may be uh, asking what's happened to our pets, as we haven't mentioned them recently. But we can assure you that they're all alive and making their presence felt. Yes, uh, by the way, is my suit back from the cleaners? Why? Well, I feel such a fool walking around in this quilt. Oh, <laughs> Anyway, just to prove that our pets are still very much with us, we'll get them to come and say how do you do as they did of yours. You're the lady. Now, uh, here are my pigeons, playmates, Basil and Lucy. Now, come and say how do you do. By the way, can they still speak? Oh, yes, they speak in their own language. What is their own language? Pigeon English. Oh, yeah. But uh, how do you know they can talk? Oh, they can talk all right. You know, Basil asked Lucy something yesterday, and she said, coo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And do they still answer questions? Oh, yes, they still talk in their own way. You see, one coo means yes, and two coos means no. Oh, I don't believe that. That's right. Now, you ask Lucy, Lucy a question now. Now, don't forget, one coo means yes, and two coos means no. One coo means yes, two... All right, I will. Now, come here, Lucy. Do you think Arthur's funny? Coo, coo. Uh, there they are. Oh, yes. She cooed twice. That means no. Oh, no, she didn't. She meant yes, yes. Oh. See? <laughs> I know better than you do. Well, come on, Big, get her to sing. Well, she hasn't been to her singing lessons lately, you know. She's had such a cold in the beak. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, she's always a trier. Now, come on, Lucy. Well, I expect she could remember who. You mean remember how, don't you? I don't. I mean that song from Sonny, you know, Who, by those two well-known English composers, Otto Harbeck and Oscar Hammerstein. Oh, uh, yes, I remember the thing, yes. Oh, yes, that's her favourite. Now, come on, Lucy. One, two, three, four. Stole my heart away <laughs> Makes me dream all day Dreams I know will never come true <laughs> Seems as though I'd ever be <laughs> Means my happiness <laughs> Oh, shut up, Lewis. What are you doing here? Well, if you brought your pigeons down, I thought I'd bring my goat, Lewis. Well, who the blazes is looking after the flat? Oh, the flat will be all right. Lewis has only been out of it an hour. No one would dare go in. Oh, I see, yeah. <laughs> I didn't think of that. Anyway, Dickie, what's Lewis's favourite song? Oh, that song about his mother. About his mother? Oh, yes. Will you sing it with him? Yes, but for the benefit of the listeners, I'm the one that sings first, you see. Oh, yeah. Now, come along, Lewis. Sing that song about your ma. Two, three, four. 
Who is it that you adore? Ma. More than roses round the door. Ma. Who is it you'd sigh for? Who is it you die for? Ma. 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 Well, there you are, playmates. That was Lewis. And now you've heard our pets again. Yeah, oh, Dickie, you haven't, you haven't told our playmates yet. Oh, yes, we've got a surprise for you. Oh, you will be surprised. You may remember that Mrs. Bagwash had a bill in her parlor window for the pantomime and she got two seats for the show. Yes. Well, she had another bill in her scullery window for the circus and they sent her two tickets on the night she had to go to her sister Aggie's coming out party. Yeah, poor old Aggie. She was back the same night for knocking a policeman's helmet off, wasn't she? (laughs) Anyway, we got the tickets for the circus and this is where the surprise comes in. Oh, you will be surprised. (laughs) Directly the clowns had finished their funny jokes and Arthur and I had put our notebooks away. Yeah. <laughs> Those poor old clowns, Dicky. <laughs> you know, they must have been very old. They kept falling over, didn't they? I Do you know. remember? Wasn't it hmm. a pity? What was the next term, Big? Do you remember? I forget. Oh, it was wasn't it that lady who stood on the clothesline drying her parasol? <laughs> you fool, she was a tight wire walker. Oh, I thought I heard a hiccup. But... Yeah. <laughs> Then there was, uh, there was Captain Theodore and his untamable monarchs of the jungle. Oh, yes. Isn't your cousin something to do with that act? Yes. He, he, well, he's the back legs of Nero, the largest lion in captivity. Yeah. <laughs> he fiddles while the front legs turn. That's right. <laughs> and then came the big surprise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the band played a fanfare. Yes, then a lot of men came in with influenza. <laughs> What do you mean, came in with influenza? Well, they were all wrapped up in blankets, weren't they? Oh, don't be silly. They were Arabs. Oh, I see. I didn't and then <laughs> the band struck up that well-known desert song, Oasis is a nice oasis, oasis. Yes. And who should come shambling into the ring but our old friend, Hector the Camel. Yes. Oh, you could have knocked me down with a fender. And do you know, playmates? <laughs> Could have done when the gag didn't go well. But you know, Playmate, <laughs> he marched right round the ring, and when he got opposite Dickie and I, and mark you, we were right back in the one and thripneys, and he stretched out his long neck, and he lifted us right out of the one and thripneys, and pushed us back into the five <laughs> uh, You thought we were going to say he lifted us into the three and six pennies, didn't you? Yeah. Where the comics who are different. Yes, the others are funny. <laughs> As soon as the show was over, we went round to see Hector in his dressing room. Yes. And we found the poor old thing in tears. He'd got the sack because they were getting another camel with two humps at the same salary. That's right. Two humps for the price of one. Anyway, we've got old Hector here in the studio with us tonight, and we're going to get him to say something to you. Now, come along, Hector. Say hello to your playmates. Good evening, chums. And that, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, was Hector. Thank you, Sid. Come on, what about a drink? All right, Hector. Now, here's George Evans with Miff Ferry's Jack Dawes, Charles Smart at the organ, and the bandwagon is directed by Phil Cardio to tell you how he's got a pocket full of dreams. Pocket full of dreams Wouldn't take the wealth on Wall Street For the treasures I possess And I calculate I'm worth my weight in happiness 
lucky, lucky me, I can live in luxury, cause I've got a pocket full of dreams. He's no millionaire, but he's not the type to care, Rudu, Rudu. Cause I've got a pocket full of dreams. Got a pocket full of dreams, oh, it's his universe. Between beef and pea soup. Hey, come along, Arthur. Hey. What are you doing? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Stinger. What, what are you doing? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I was looking at my fan mail. Oh, anything interesting? Well, not much. There's a bill for a new cage bought. That new cage we bought for the pigeons, you know. Oh, that great thing I had to pull all the way home on Sid Walker's barrow. You had to pull. I like that. I was helping. Mm, I know you were at the back of the barrow, but I didn't feel I was getting much assistance from you. Oh, I was helping, all right. Were you pushing? Yeah. No, well, I wasn't pushing, but I was sitting inside the cage carrying the perches. Oh, you silly <laughs> little man. That's fair, isn't it? What does that postcard say? Oh, it's the same old story. Why is Richard Murdoch called Stinker? Listen, don't you think it's about time I told them? Yes, I think the time's about right, don't okay, you? Okay, then, yes, I think it is. <laughs> but now, you go upstairs and pour out our supper. That suits me, I thank you. Bye-bye. Yes. And I'll tell the playmates exactly how I came to be called Stinker. Well, now, so many people have asked me why I'm called Stinker that if you'll spare a few moments, I'll tell you as briefly as possible. In order to get the hang of things, I want you to cast your minds back a few years to the time when it all started, and this was when my uncle was staying in Paris. And my uncle couldn't speak a word of French, except sort of things like La Plume de Martens and Les Pantalons du Jardinier et sur la table dans la bibliothèque and that sort of thing. But anyhow, he went to the theatre one night and there was some French piece on. I think it may have been that thing that was broadcast a short time ago called La Rondine and he thought it was something British and had something to do with La Rondine bridges falling down or something. Anyhow, <laughs> he went to see this thing, do you see, and he couldn't understand a word of it and uh, in, when anyone else laughed, he laughed. And when anyone else applauded, he applauded, you see. And he got awfully good at this. And eventually, he let out a shriek of laughter. And he found that he was the only person in the theatre laughing. And everyone else was turning around and staring at him, you see. And the man sitting in the seat behind him wrote something down in French on a piece of paper and handed it to my uncle. And my uncle naturally couldn't translate it. So he showed it to the gentleman sitting on his, uh, his, his left. And he got very, very annoyed and wouldn't translate it, you see. So he showed it to the lady sitting on his uh, right. And she also got extremely annoyed and slapped his face. So my uncle was in a terrible state about this. He didn't know what to do. So he got out of his seat and he went to the back of the stalls and he went up to one of the ushers. And he said, usher, usher, all fall down. He said, uh, <laughs> would you mind translating what's written on this piece of paper, you see? And the usher took one look at the piece of paper and he got extremely annoyed and summoned the manager. And the manager came along and looked at this piece of paper and he also got extremely annoyed and summoned the commissioner and had my uncle thrown out on his ear. His left ear, I think it was. He got the marks to this day. And uh, he didn't know what to do, you see. My uncle was in a dreadful state at this time, you see. So he thought, well... He went back to his hotel, and he went up to the manager of the hotel. And he said, now look here, I've got something written in French on a piece of paper which I can't translate, you see. And every time I show it to anybody, they refuse to do it. So do you mind telling me what this means, you see? And the manager of the hotel looked at the piece of paper, and he got extremely annoyed and had him thrown out of the hotel. <laughs> so my uncle by this time was 
bit of old frantic, you see, didn't know what to do, so a very bright idea struck him. Now, he had a very old school friend of his who was living in Paris. He was a Frenchman, as a matter of fact, a French nobleman. His name was the Comte du vet <laughs> And uh, he rang him up on the phone and he said, now listen, that old boy, he said, you and I were at St. Wasps together and we used to stay with each other's people in the halls and all that sort of thing. He said, now, you're my oldest and greatest chum. He said, I've got a problem here. I've got something written in French on a piece of paper which nobody will translate to me. I want you to promise here and now on the phone that you will come round to my hotel at four o'clock this afternoon and tell me exactly what this means. Now, no mucking about. Will you do it, you see? And the comte said, I promise. At least he said, I promise, because he was a Frenchman, you see. <laughs> and uh, so at four o'clock that afternoon... The comte arrived at my uncle's hotel and uh, he was ushered into his room and they shook hands and sang their old school song and he repeated his promise and my uncle thought, ah, at last I'm going to know what this is, you see. And he put his hand in his pocket to get out the piece of paper and he found he'd lost it. And that is actually why I'm called Stinker and now Phil Cardew and the Wagoners with <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Jack Dawes. Uh, Miss Ferris, Jack Dawes, Phil Carter, and the Wagoners, as I said before, are going to give you a little tune called What a Fool I've Been. I think all. <laughs> We give you the golden voice of radio, Sid Walker. <laughs> it's funny how our wandering drunk man with his warm, lovable personality is always getting dragged into other people's worries and troubles and problems which he sometimes finds difficult to answer. So each week he brings one to you to ask you what you would do. He needs the help of every one of you, so don't forget to send in your postcards. What would you do? That's what Mr. Walker wants to know. <laughs> the 
the street. Strange folks I meet in the rigs, bottles all bow. Here he comes, his old barrow weighed down with pots and pans and all sorts of other ornaments. Radio's junk man, Mr. Walker. Day after day, I'm on me way in the rigs, bottles or bones, in the old rigs, bottles or bones. Good evening, chums. <laughs> this is your old pal Sid Walker, a raising of his hat and saying, how are you? Well, mates, you seem to have a lot of different ideas about last week's little problem, which only goes to show us how it was a real teaser. Well, now, I told Mr. Wallace that he should tell the girl what he'd seen or, or thought he'd seen in the flat next door. As I said to him, what you saw may have been an hallucination or a touch of liver. But on the other hand, you may have seen something what was to turn up in the future and, and it was your duty to warn the girl. After all, mates, strange things do happen what we can't account for, don't they? And it ain't always wise to laugh at them. I mean to say, look at radio and television, why, a few years ago, most people would have said that, don't be silly, it ain't possible. And here we are tonight, an old junk man a chatting to you, and, and some of you's listening a thousands of miles away, bless you. See me meaning? And now I wonder how many of you in London what's listening are, are following this here serial story in the evening mail. But well, most of you, I expect I'm reading it myself, I am. It has caught on, ain't it? I suppose it's got a real human drama, a sort of thing you can get your teeth into. Like tonight's instalment, where the heroine, what's seriously ill, looks like she might be saved by the doctor who's fallen in love with her. Uh, and the villain, too. <laughs> Bit of all right, he is. <laughs> Funny how they seem to live, don't they? Even though they're only people in the story. And you know, mates, right now there's a young girl laying in a hospital. What this here serial means everything in the world to. Yes, life itself, uh, and, and more than that. But I've, um, I, I better begin at the beginning, hadn't I? I? I'm in such a hurry for you to hear all about it that I'm kind of overreaching myself, putting the cart before the horse, you know. Well... Well, it's this way. Yesterday morning, the editor of the Evening Mail, he, he rings up my pal, Gordon Crier, at, at the BBC. Hello, Gordon Crier here. This is Ryland, editor of the Evening Mail. Oh, yes. Look here, we want to get hold of your junk man, Sid Walker, very urgently. Could you help us? Well, sure, what's it all about? Oh, we've got a devil's own problem up here. He's about the only man who can handle it. I see. Hmm, he's out with his barrow now, of course, but I'm expecting him to drop in about four... Could he come down to Fleet Street afterwards? Five o'clock be all right? Fine. He'll be at your office about that time. Thanks then. very much. I think we're obliged, Mr. Ryland, I'm sure. That, that's me all over. Oh, we're very grateful to you. Now then, what, what's the trouble? I think Dr. Allen here had better give you the facts. Yeah, right, uh, Doctor, cough it up. Isn't it? Well, I've got a patient, a young girl, about 17, who's been ill nearly a year now. Ah, oh, poor kid. Yeah, she's had a pretty bad time. I won't worry with the details of her case. But broadly speaking, her illness has become as much mental as physical. Uh. She's actually recovered from the original nervous breakdown she was suffering when she went into hospital. But her mind won't let her admit it, do you understand? Oh, as clear as daylight, chum. You know, the mind's a queer box of tricks, sure enough. <laughs> You've said it. Well, anyway, my patient got very depressed. Morbid and mentally unhealthy altogether. Yes, I'll get you. So much so that until recently, I confess I had my doubts, she pulled through. Oh, as bad as that, eh? Every bit. Well, then came the serial story in the evening mail. Ah, <laughs> I'm reading that. So is everybody. Yes, good stuff, ain't it? A real winner, if ever there was one. That's right. <laughs> but I don't quite see what this has got to do with this poor girl. It's everything to do with her, Mr. Walker. Really, now? She's been reading it from the start. And it's gripped her imagination completely. In particular, she's identified herself with the heroine. Today, I tell you, she as good as believes she is the heroine. Oh, lummy. And as during the course of the story, this character has overcome setbacks and disappointments and so on, so the girl has got better. It's amazing. It certainly shows you how some people believe in these characters. Yes, wonderful, ain't it? Ah, when the mind's sick, there's no telling how the body will act. 
A kind of auto-suggestion, eh? That's the idea. Yes, I'll get you. Well, as you may know, in yesterday's instalment, the heroine suddenly fallen ill. And the doctor, hero chap, and the villain... You already. Oh, you have? Yes, I... Well, anyway, Mr. Ryland tells me that in the end, the heroine will die. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, you, you, you shouldn't have told me. And that means my patient dies, too. But, uh, Al... As you just said, auto-suggestion. <whistles> Truth. Here, yeah, but, but listen, mate, so can't you get the author to change it? G- give it a happy ending. Well, I was going to arrange that. Then why don't you? Now, don't matter about the story. After all said and done, and the, and the public, they won't know. Just a minute, just a minute. What? It so happens this morning, a doctor up from Bournemouth comes in to see me. He has a patient, elderly woman she is, also obsessed with the serial. Case very similar to mine. Ah, but with this difference. She wants the heroine to die. You see, she's acutely jealous of her. She hates her. And when in the story she's made to suffer and endure hardship, this woman's health improves. And if things go well with the girl, the woman starts to go under, and it's all they can do to keep her alive. Yeah, all the opposite to your patient, Doctor. Absolutely. Yeah, well, you know, this is the queerest business I've ever heard of. <laughs> Me too. But the point is, what's to be done? If the heroine dies, so does the girl. If she lives, the old lady throws up the sponge. Exactly. The last installment's on Friday, Mr. Walker. Now, how should the serial end? Well, that's what I want to know. How should it end? Yes, and that's what I want to know, chums. If you was the editor of the Evening Mail, how would you tell the author to end that serial? Would you have the heroine live and the girl too and, and risk the old woman dying or... Or would you have the heroine die and the girl too, more than likely, while the old woman would live? Now, you know, it's a strange sort of problem altogether, ain't it? But think it over and drop us a postcard saying, let heroine live or let heroine die, according to what you think yourself. Address the postcard to me, Sid Walker's the name, Broadcasting House, London West One, and put bandwagon in the top left-hand corner... Well, so long, chums. <laughs> I do drop against some balmy things, don't I? A Sid Walker appears, as usual, by permission of Jack Buchanan. And now here's Betty Buckman with her song of the week, which this time is a number called Mine Alone from a new show called Magia. I hope that's the way to pronounce it. Magia Melody, in which he's assisted by Charles Smart at the organ and Phil Cardio and the Wagoners. Mine Alone. <laughs>
stars from the heaven came tumbling down. Nightingales sing in the heart of the town. So sweet, so sweet is love. Roses in winter and snow in July. Stars grow on trees that are flowers in the sky. It's clear. Arthur, put that paper down. What are you doing reading a paper in the middle of bandwagon? Well, I'm looking at the situation's vacant. What on earth for? Well, you know what number bandwagon this is, don't you? Yeah, number 16. Well, that means in eight weeks' time, we should be back at our old job. What's that? Looking for work. Oh, day after day. So we <laughs> shall. <laughs> well, you know, I hadn't thought of that big... No. Have you got your card stamped up to date? Yes, all the stamps are up in the top left-hand corner. Mm, but this is a serious matter, Big, you know... Have you got anything put by for a rainy day? Well, I could spend a weekend in Manchester. Could you? Yeah, just about. You know, we ought to have a sideline. Oh, what do you mean, sideline? Well, I've been thinking. People have got to eat. <laughs> oh, oh, this is going to be interesting. Draw up your chair, Grandfather. <laughs> well, why shouldn't you and I start a restaurant? Eh, yeah, well, I don't know how about it. Well, I do. I know all about it. Yes, but I can't cook. There's no need for you to cook. You can be the waiter. Oh, who, me? Yeah. Oh, I don't know anything about waiting. Well, I'll show you how to do it and put you put you through your paces. Uh, put me through me what? Put you through your paces. Oh, I thought you said me braces. I'm oh, sorry. No. <laughs> I didn't really. I thought it would be funny to say that. You were saying. Comical little man. <laughs> now, uh, you are a silly little man, yeah. really. You go outside and disguise yourself as a gentleman. Yeah. What, 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 what? And, uh, By what? heavens, an insult. You're smart, sir, for this. Is he? I haven't a card. And I'll arrange the table while you go outside, and then you come in and ask for something to eat. I'm the bloke that goes out and comes in and has something to eat. Eh? That's right. You see, All right, yeah. that suits me. All yeah, right, well, all right. Come on. All right, come all on, right, come on. all right. Don't rush me. I haven't made up my mind whether I'll come in or not yet. <laughs> I've a jolly good mind to go to that other cafe across the road. <laughs> cafe? Cafe. Restaurant. Place de manger. Cocoa rooms, or what have you. I haven't. You haven't, right. Share them. <laughs> well, come on. Now, don't lark about. Don't lark about. All right, I'm coming in. Oh, blow it. What's the matter? I'm trying to shut this revolving door. Oh. <laughs> Whoa. Well, what have you... Have you shut it? Yeah, I've shut my finger in it. Yeah. Well, now, come on, hurry up. I'm the waiter and you're the customer. I'm the, you're the waiter and I'm the customer. That's oh, right. Viva Voce. Right, now, you're the waiter. Yes. Are you, are you still the waiter? I'm the waiter. Well, wait there till I come back. Oh. <laughs> I say, fella. Yes? Are you the same waiter two minutes later? Yes, sir. Put my velour in the garage, would you mind? <laughs> Very good, sir. Nice weather we're having for this time of the day, sir. Yes, a bit foggy underfoot, don't you think? <laughs> what would you like, sir? Uh, what would I like to eat? I don't know. Have you got any samples? Samples? Yes. Uh, 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 you know, the samples. You better show me the, uh, the you and I. The you and I? Uh, the me and you. Uh, the... Oh, you mean the, uh, the carte the, toujours? Yeah, uh, toujours sir. la politesse. Well, yeah. I don't know, waiter. I'm a bit finicky today. You know, everything I eat seems to fly to my stomach. Hmm. <laughs> I suppose it's just peevishness. I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps you'd like something to tickle your palate, Oh, sir. but my palate's not ticklish. Oh, there you go again. May I suggest something, sir? Oh, do, oh, do, oh, do, oh, do. Dang, uh, pick a penny. Oh, do. <laughs> Consommé Julien à la Richelle, Crème Royale de Sanitoff. Uh, 
Yeah. Oh, I never eat them without there's an R in the month. No, 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 sir. I was merely inquiring if you would take soup. Uh, soup. Will the band be playing? Presently, sir. Then in fairness to the band, I will not take soup. Uh, no soup. No soup. Well, what about fish, sir? Well, uh, oh, no, no fish, thank you. I never eat fish. But our fish is fresh, sir. It's all hand-caught. I don't care if it's machine-sewn. I don't want any. Uh, no fish, sir. No fish. Any roast beef, sir? No, thank you. Any vegetables with it? Yes, please. What are you talking about? Uh, sorry, sir. Yes. Yes. Now, what about sweet? Now, that's a good idea. I'll have a quarter of licorice all sorts. You're <laughs> impossible. I know, but I'm having it seen to. Well, <laughs> what? <laughs> what do you want? Well, uh, uh, will you give me an estimate? An estimate? If you don't mind, yes. <laughs> How much is the gravy? The... <laughs> the gravy's freezer. Oh, I say, that's marvellous, isn't it? And uh, how much is the bread? We give you the bread, sir. Oh, I say, that's too ridiculous. And how much is the water? No charge for the water. No sir. charge for the water. Right, well, I'll have three plates of gravy, two loaves of bread, and a bucket of water. Oh, <laughs> you're hopeless. You come here to be a waiter. Now, yes. remember, a waiter should be able to speak French. Oh, should he? Yes. I didn't know that. Can you speak French? Fluidly. You can. <laughs> well, what's the French for eau de cologne? Uh, lavender water. Quite right, yes. <laughs> Uh, now, what's the French for apple? Uh, oh, apple... Uh, oh, they won't want any apples, will they? Nevertheless, what is the French for apple? Well, it all depends what sort of apple you mean, whether you mean a Dorothy Perkins or a, a King Edward or a, or a Ripstone Pippin or a Toffee Apple or a Crab Apple or an Adam's Apple or just the plain Jaffa. Oh. <laughs> I mean, what is the French for apple? Pom. Right, two apples. Pom, pom. <laughs> Stop me before I say three. Yes, <laughs> and... Come on, I'll be the customer and you'll be the waiter and see what sort of a mess you make. Oh, all right. Now, uh, I'm the waiter this time and yes. you're the man what comes in and has something to eat. That's right, yes. You'll be lucky. <laughs> now, this is, uh, this is me coming in. You amaze me. Good morning. Good gracious. <laughs> <laughs> That's witty, isn't it? Brilliant, yes. <laughs> Do you serve lobster? We serve anybody, sir, you see. <laughs> I knew the answer to that one, didn't I? <laughs> well, I want something to eat. On a plate and in a nose bag. <laughs> I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. We've only got the Doovers. The do- <laughs> well, have you any soup? Soup? Wait a minute. Here, you can't rush me like that. What? We've got to come to some arrangement first. Do you want the ten and sixpenny luncheon or the half crown special? Oh, the half crown special. Oh, oh, right you are. It's the same thing, only I've got to take these flowers off the table. Oh. Well, have you any soup? Uh, have any soup? Now, let me see. I'll have to ring up the head office and inquire. Hello? Give me Welbeck 4468. Yes, 6844. Hello? Is that Museum 00013? Oh, put me through to the catering department, will you? Oh, is that you, Charlie? Look here. Have me any soup? Yes? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, uh, yes, yes. No. Would you like some porridge? No, I don't want any porridge. I want some soup. Would you like noodle poodle or cockadoodle? <laughs> well, what's the difference? There is none. What, no difference? No, no soup. Would you like some tripe? Yes, I'd like some tripe. Right, George, switch on the wireless, will you? <laughs> There's an old friend. <laughs> <Hey. laughs> they get in for nothing and laugh at us. Go on. Come here. I'd like some fish. You'd like some fish. Would you like boiled fish or fried fish? Because if you have fried fish, you must have chipes. <laughs> Well, have you any fresh salmon? I think it'll be fresher. What do you mean you think it'll well, be fresh? Well, we don't know till we open the tin. Oh, I see. Well, what game have you? Well, there's a chef-apenny board on the counter and a dartboard in the long bar. Look here, what have you got? Ice cream. Sundays. Weekdays as well. Chicken. Yes, dear. Oh, I think I have. Have you got a chicken? Uh, well, we haven't got one in the shop, sir, but there's one in the garden next door. I'll go and knock that off for you. I won't be a minute, sir. Right. Oh, here you are, sir. Here you are. What on earth is that? That's an Abyssinian partridge. Do you like it? Take the beastly thing away. Take it back to its mate. Oh, I can't do that, sir. Why not? It's a widow. Well, what sweets have you got? College pud. Is the pud good? Oh, very good pud. Well, I have a small Porsche. All right. Porsche cold pud coming up, Sam. Here you are, Sam. There's the college pud. Uh, oh, I say this is a very small portion. Well, it's a very small college, sir. It's almost a prep. <laughs> well, what college is it? Wait a minute. Eaton. No. <laughs> this is dreadful. Where's the manager? He's gone out to lunch, sir. Well, that's where I'm going. Uh, before you go, sir, remember the waiter. Remember the waiter. I shall never forget you. I've only got two words to say to you. And them is... Get out. And I've only two words to say to you. And what are they? I'm going. Oh, I've been wasting my time. And I've wasted mine. I really don't know what to do. I'm fed up with your chatter. Well, I don't suppose it'll matter. I've, I've been wasting my time on you. you.
we are once again with the two new voices of the week. And the first of them is a young lady from South Africa who's done a great deal of broadcasting over there, but this is her first appearance on English air. Her name is Joan Ailing, and with Charles Spart of the BBC Theatre Organ, she's going to sing you a very popular number, My Curly-Headed Babby. My curly-headed baby We'll sit below the sky And sing a song to the moon Oh, my baby My curly-headed baby your daddy's in the cotton fields, a working for his crew. does you want the moon to play with? Or the stars to run away with They'll come if you don't cry So lula, 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 bye-bye In your mammy's arms be creeping And soon you'll be asleep My curly-headed baby I'll dance you fast asleep And love you as I sing Oh, my baby My curly-headed baby just tuck your head like a little bird below your mammy's wing. Oh, lo, 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 ba, ba. Does you want the moon? the stars to run away with they'll come if you don't cry so lo 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 ba ba in your mammy second new voice tonight is a pianist. His name is Rob Stewart, and Rob is going to play you a medley of popular numbers. Rob Stewart.
two new voices for this week. The first one, the lady singer, was Joan Ailing, and the pianist was Rob Stewart. Don't forget their names as the voting starts very, very soon now. And next week, we hope to bring you two more new, new voices. Big-hearted Arthur, that's me. Clean if I'm not very clever, but only because I've got to be. If poor Dickie Murdoch should faint at the mic, or the jackdaws decide that they'll go out on strike, or if Bishop Pepper gets knocked off his bike, big-hearted Arthur, they stand tall. Big-hearted Arthur, that's me. Well, playmates, before I start my bit of nonsense tonight, I must tell you that I've had a lot of requests for the umbrella song I sang last week. So to save a lot of writing, I'm going to sing it again, you see. So you're jolly well right. Anyway, of course, the, the novelty's really worn off as our Prime Minister has come back now. But um, you, uh, <laughs> you want the song, and so you'll have it. Big-hearted Arthur, that's my... Anyway, for the benefit of those who didn't hear the song last week, it's a little parody on Stay In My Arms, Cinderella, and I'm going to sing it at you the way I sang it last week. Hey, thank you. Stay on my arm, umbrella, everywhere I wander, I'll hold you. When they all salute and do their drill, I'll cling to you and raise my trill be so stay on my arm umbrella tell the world I've never unfurled you on every trip I take you abroad may world accord be my reward I think you're mightier than the sword. Umbrella, stay on my arm. <laughs> I, th I honestly, I think I sang it better last week. <laughs> I think it's this wet weather. I got a bit of guitar selling, but I got that gene off marvellously last week. <laughs> Made myself cry and a few people in the studio. Well, anyway, uh, practice, I, uh, playmates, I do hope you notice that attractive wobble in my voice tonight. I have got that through uh, gargling with Dickie's hair tonic, you see. <laughs> it said on the bottle, guaranteed to produce a delightful wavy effect, so I chanced it, you see. <laughs> Hence the wobble. But I must tell you, I had a letter from a lady last week signing herself mother of six. She wanted to know where she could get a record of my voice to help her to get her children to sleep at night, you see. <laughs> nice of her, wasn't it? But I wrote and told her to try persuasive methods before resorting to violence, you see. <laughs> and talking of letters, we've been getting scores of sales catalogues these past few days, and a lovely catalogue arrived this morning, and I got it out of the letterbox and hurried back to bed with it, and Dickie and I put our bed jackets on. <laughs> uh, oh, I haven't told you about our bed jackets, have I? Oh, they're ever so pretty. Norsea knitted them for us, you see. Uh, Dickie's is a sort of puce with pink epaulets, you see. And mine's the latest shade of BBC Comedian's Blue with uh, little egg stains all down the front. It's ever so nice. Mind you, it's, uh, it cuts a bit under the arms. Norsea, Norsea said she made them to last, you see, and I think she must have used steel wool for mine. <laughs> Still, it's very useful because when I'm not wearing it, we use it as a fire guard, you see. It's quite a good idea. But to uh, get back to the sales, Dickie and I looked through the catalogue and we found a wonderful bargain in three-ply double-breasted reversible comms, you see. <laughs> Absolutely the latest model with elastic under the insteps. They're simply colossal. <laughs> oh, and by the way, uh, playmates, thanks for the comms I've had this round. <laughs> quite a number. <laughs> Still, that's a long story. Well, now... Uh, <laughs> Now, well, exactly. Now, anyway, these that I saw in the shop, they were exactly what I wanted, but it said in the catalogue they were being sold for a ridiculous figure. So, of course, they were no use to me, you see. <laughs> well, my figure may be unconventional, but it's not ridiculous. Anyway, I refuse to believe in it. Anyway, Dickie and I went along to Dagenham and Dog's Bodies, and my dears, the crowds... <laughs> 
Well, Dickie and I lost each other. He got swept into the swimsuits and I got carried into the corsets. And uh, <laughs> Anyway, we met at lunchtime. Dickie was holding a lot of parcels in his arms and I had the manager and the detective holding onto my arms. And, <laughs> and you know what they did? They chucked me out of the side entrance. They did. However, it just shows what a bit of influence will do. When I told them I was big-hearted Arthur, they took me back into the shop and they rushed me down and they chucked me out of the front entrance. So, <laughs> didn't make much difference after all, did it? Well, now, Playmates, my chauffeur has just popped in to tell me there's four and six on the clock. So, I'm going to, um, I'm going to sing you a little song I've had many, many requests for. I'm going to try and get them all in before we finish Bandwagon. But I've taken them in order of precedence. <laughs> oh, arc at the boy. But uh, <laughs> this is a little one I've had many requests for, and I entitle it The Mop. Hey, thank you all. <laughs> you can have your birds, you can have your bees, but to me they're simply froth. For the thing I'd really like to be is not a bird or a flower or a bee or a fish or a camel or a jumping flea, but a moth, a little moth, fluttering round the candle, frightened to go near, singeing off your chassis and feeling very queer, or bashing out your brains against the chandelier like a moth, a little moth. Oh, like the fairy, just like a fairy, chewing up yards of cloth. But think of the joys and the fun, me boys, enjoyed by a flighty, quite all righty. Just had a nibble off a lady's nighty, non-stop nibbling mom. You can have your ham, you can have your lamb, you can have your chicken broth. But the things of which I like to dine are a little bit of fur or creepy chine or some red flannelette from an old mate's spine like a mop, a little mop. Bringing up a family, remembering it's due To tell them what they must do and what they mustn't do To choose what they must do and what they must do Like a moth, a little moth Oh, like a fairy, just like a fairy Chewing up yards of fluff But think of the joys and the fun, me boys Enjoyed by a daring, drinking, swearing Don't get a hang for bits of camp For non-stop nibbling moth When you shout till your horse on your big golf course, it arouses all my wrath. They do nine holes, then they all get tight, put to nestle in a camisole pure and white, and do eighteen holes in the middle of the night. That's a moth, a little moth. Yet upon occasion, life must be a curse. Imagine for a moment, could anything be worse than being found dead inside a Scotsman's purse, like a moth, a little moth. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, I think you oh, oh, light and dairy, just like a fairy, chewing up yards of stuff. But think of the end without a friend of a crashed up, smashed up, crushed up, bust up, squashed on the floor and finally brushed up. Who the heck wants to be a mob? I nibble whatever may come my way. I nibble all night and I nibble all day. But... Think of the joys and the fun, me boys enjoyed by a flighty, quite all righty. Going to have a nibble off a lady's nighty, non-stop nibbling moth, they die. Bye-bye, playmates. I've said my good night. I didn't know it was so early. But the, uh, the band, band, now be quiet. Well, I'll right. say my piece. You see, the band should have played another piece, but we're a bit over time. But anyway, save them on for next week. So, on behalf of all the band, we say good night. Good night. Good night.